be seated. If you would, pray with me. Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. For you alone are our strength and redeemer. Amen. Amen. Uh, just a brief word before we begin uh, looking at the scripture today. Um, we have a lot going on in church. And one of the main things we are doing is we are welcoming five little ones uh, through baptism. In just a moment, that'll come right after the sermon. Um, and here's the thing. Our little ones have permission to cut the sermon short like five little egg timers. And if they go off, well, we're here for them. And so we're going to move right along to the next part of uh, the sermon um, or of the service. If we, if we cut most of the, of the sermon, um, Chris Segan and I can make a recording and put it up online. So you won't miss this, but if our little ones decide it's time, uh, it's time. Fair enough? All right. Parents of little ones, sound good? All right. Well, again, we have a lot going on um, in church today. All Saints is one of the seven principal feasts of the church uh, where we remember the Christian dead, that great cloud of witnesses spoken of in the book of Hebrews, uh, those who are before the throne praising our God in the book of Revelation. Um, this would include for many of us, our parents, maybe our grandparents, friends, uh, children who might have gone to be with the Lord, maybe even little ones that we never had the chance to meet. All Saints is a day where we remember those who are part of the body of Christ, but we see no longer. Uh, Thursday, you might have noticed, if anyone rang on your doorbell, it was Halloween. Um, All Hallows' Eve, Halloween, yeah, that's right. The day before All Saints, it's a treat, right? It's wonderful. Um, and so the way that works is the feast itself of All Saints is November 1st. Um, some churches, not Anglican churches, but some churches celebrate another holiday uh, on November 2nd, All Souls, um, which incidentally I think is a mistake. It draws too clear of a distinction between um, everyday ordinary people who follow Jesus and the heroes of the faith. Um, it's based on uh, purgatory, which we don't, we don't hold to in the Anglican church. Um, but today also, I, I heard that you got an extra hour of sleep. Everyone's well rested? Yeah, daylight savings ended. Um, let's see, what else is happening today? We have baptisms. Um, we're going to welcome new members. Uh, it's Sunday, so we celebrate the death and resurrection of Jesus together. Um, oh, and there was a half marathon downtown just for fun to kind of navigate. Uh, oh, and there's an election uh, coming up on Tuesday. Uh, we sent out some resources to be praying for that as a community, um, but primarily it's Sunday. And so we gather to worship the risen Lord, to meet him in his word and at his table. Uh, it's a day of prayer and grief and joy and gratitude and peace and anxiety all at the same time. We have a lot going on today in church, and I'm sure each one of us brings a lot into church today as we gather. I mean, it actually reminds me of a Pixar film. They just made a sequel of it, but who here has seen the first Inside Out? All right, most of the room. Um, I've been told by Father Bill, it just shows, is it parts theory is a thing in psychology? I might have gotten that wrong. I'm not sure. But it has these emotions that live within this girl named Riley. And each of the emotions is personified, and so you have joy and sadness and disgust and anger and fear. Uh, the sequel, she's going through puberty, so you get more emotions that make no sense um, to anybody. But each of the uh, emotions um, comes forward when they're needed in Riley's life. And what I found the most interesting is that each one of those emotions, uh, they actually help categorize her memories. And so early on in the film, each memory, each event gets one emotion. Okay, that's something joyful. That's something sad. Um, that's something that fills us with anxiety, whatever it might be. Um, and by the end of the movie, what's interesting is that you figure out in this Pixar film, and it's, it's pretty insightful, uh, that different events and different memories um, can take on more than one emotion. Um, you can look at something with joy and with sadness. 
Um, and you can bring those together in a mature way. And I think that's really helpful on All Saints Sunday to think that way. Because there's many of those whom we love and we see no longer. Um, and it's okay to bring that as a mixture of joy and sadness. Um, to offer that before uh, the Lord. Um, and we don't have to be just happy clappy and grin. and be, We can actually be, okay, this is a heavy day. Um, if we are feeling that loss deeply. One of the things we do on All Saints is grow up into Christ, um, into that maturity of bringing the full range of our emotions before the Lord. The psalmist says, worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. And part of that includes our joyful lament about those who are with the Lord even now. And we remember the saints of God as the saints of God as part of the communion of the saints. We gather around this table with them in worship, those whom we love uh, but see no longer. Um, and we wait. We're especially mindful on this day of the great hope we have in Christ, the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come, when God's glory will renew and flood and fill his good creation with the new heavens and the new earth. So this day, All Saints, is about the communion of the saints. You might recognize that phrase. We use it in the creed, right? We believe in the communion of the saints. Um, who has had a long lesson on that in the past? Maybe Bishop Frank and Chris. Okay, Deacon Chris and Bishop Frank have studied this. Uh, for the rest of us, I was uh, looking it up this week. Okay, what do we think about this communion of the saints? Um, especially, uh, I look to a theologian named Alistair McGrath. He's an English theologian. He's an Anglican. And here's how he defines this doctrine that we confess our belief in every week in the creed. The church is not a static building, but a dynamic pilgrim people who are constantly moving on in faith and obedience. It includes those who have gone ahead of us and those who will follow. It is a great fellowship of faith spanning the ages and the continents. It's about the saints of God. I just wonder, when you hear, hear that term, uh, saint, what do you think of? Do you think of the heroes? Do you think of St. Paul, or Thomas Cramner, or Mother Teresa? I think most of us, when we hear the phrase saint, that person is a saint, we tend to think of the holiest people we know, those who have exhibited the character of God, um, and certainly we hope we all grow up into that. But the way the word saint is used in the New Testament is interesting. Um, two things I noticed about it. Um, almost always in the New Testament, the word saint is plural. It's referring to the saints of God, the church that Jesus is bringing together by the Holy Spirit. Um, and the second is that everyone who believes in Jesus is called a saint. There's not a fruit check. And so even a church like Corinth, where Paul writes to the Corinthians, you know, Paul's upset with them. There's immoral living. There's bad doctrine. They're dividing over leaders. He addresses them as the saints of God. He recognizes their worth in the Lord and hopes for them to lean in and mature into who they are in Christ. With all of their maturity and all of their issues, he calls them saints. He reminds us that every Christian is a holy one, a saint, one being uh, made holy by the Lord Jesus, um, who are covered by his righteousness. Um, and wait a minute, you might say, well, I know myself, or I know the person I'm sitting next to. Um, I'm no saint. And you're right in the sense that uh, we struggle with sin. We struggle with progress. We struggle with maturity. Um, but the shift in our thinking is that we are saints not because of anything in ourselves, but because of Christ the perfect and the holy one. When we are connected to him, when we are in Christ, we are part of the body of Christ of which he is the head, then we are counted saints because of his righteousness and his holiness. And thus every Christian's a saint. And we're part of this communion, the fellowship of all of God's church. And there's this supernatural unity, this connective tissue binding us together, including those uh, we love but see no longer that are with the Lord. Um, I want to illustrate this a little bit, and I want to be, be careful here. Um, when, when folks have a loved one die, 
Uh, grief takes all kinds of forms. Um, and you hear all kinds of things as people cope with and process what they're going through. Uh, sometimes people will come to me and they'll, they'll, they'll share something with me. And I'm like, that's terrible theology, but God loves you. And I'm going to give you a hug and not a theology test in this moment. Um, and, but I was thinking about, okay, what's the right way to think about those whom we love but we don't see anymore? And uh, I was working at a church in Texas, and we had one of our staff members. Um, he was in his early 60s. His name was Wayne Lambert. Wonderful guy. Um, one day had a stroke um, and died instantly. Um, and his family was having a lot of trouble, as you would, naturally processing his death. It was so surprising. Uh, it happened so fast. No one expected it. And then he's gone um, in his early 60s. And I remember taking the opportunity gently um, to talk about the communion of the saints, this doctrine that seems irrelevant until someone you know is with the Lord. Um, and they were kind of wondering if, you know, when the wind blew the wind chimes, if that was, or, you know, we, we kind of get a glimmer in his favorite chair. And it's like, you know, th those, again, I'm going to hug you. I'm not going to correct you in the moment. Um, but ultimately, there's something deeper and more beautiful for those who know the Lord. Because we're connected by the Holy Spirit still with those whom we love and see no longer. Um, not in some goofy, they're watching over me sense, but in a deeply rooted biblical sense where we can be glad there with the Lord who watches over all of us and cares over each one of us. Um, and I suggested that the most uh, appropriate time to really bring that to the forefront of their mind is when we gather for Holy Communion. Because we gather at this table and we say we come with those surrounding the throne of God, angels, archangels, and all the saints of heaven. It's like when you come in and share this meal, you join in worship with Wayne. I remember telling his wife Charlotte that. And her response was, I'm gonna be in church every Sunday. I'm gonna go and join with my husband in worshiping the Lord. And it was, all, it was always just wonderful to see her. Um, she has two great kids, they're adults now following the Lord. Um, but just to watch them deepen in that. Um, not get stuck in something kind of shallow and superficial, but go, I can bring this to the Lord, I can bring this in worship, and I can trust uh, where he is. And so when we say we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, call to mind those whom you love who are with the Lord. Because they are beholding uh, what we worship by faith as they are in God's presence. We believe that those who have died in the Lord are safe in the presence of God. Um, Bishop N.T. Wright has a book called For All the Saints. It's a little bitty short book. He says, the Christian dead are held firmly within the conscious love of God and the conscious presence of Jesus Christ while they await the day, the day of resurrection. And since both the departed saints and we ourselves are in Christ, we share with them in the communion of the saints. They are still our brothers and sisters in the Lord. So that's how I, when I come to this day, that's, that's what's in the forefront of my mind when I think about those whom I love um, and see no longer. Um, I'll actually share really quickly. Uh, some of you know that my father, who was part of this church, died early in the life of this church. Um, and it was funny. He actually passed away while he was going through confirmation preparation. Um, and I remember sharing with uh, the guy who kind of pastored me through it, Henry Baldwin. Some of you know Henry. I know we have some Holy Cross folks here. Um, Dean Henry, I said, Dean Henry, uh, my dad didn't get to get confirmed. <laughs> He's like, uh, your father was confirmed when he came into the presence of the Lord. Um, there is no more confirmation that he needs. And so uh, I just wanted to share that with you to go, even clergy aren't immune to crazy thoughts about these things um, and the need to be comforted by wise saints around us. All right, uh, let's shift a little bit. I want to look at uh, the Beatitudes for just a moment. How are our egg timers doing? Hartwin, you doing okay? All right, Lathan, Lathan's rocking and rolling. Margaret, we're good? All right, Hazel, I think, is in the, with the kids. Uh, and Matthew, how we doing? Oh, he's great. All right. Well, if they give me extra time, y'all are in trouble. <laughs> we get a whole extra hour today. 
I mean, I'm just saying. Um, no, uh, let's talk about the Beatitudes for just a moment um, and being ordinary saints of the kingdom because many of us, most of us, uh, will, Lord willing, live ordinary lives of Christian faithfulness. Ordinary in the best sense of the word, which does bring us to the gospel lesson from the Sermon on the Mount. Um, again, this, uh, traditionally, the location of this are the low hills right beside the Sea of Galilee. So in the region of Capernaum, you could probably see this hill from Capernaum, from Peter's house, from his uh, mother's. You can see everything right there. It's, everything happens really close. Um, and Jesus is teaching. Uh, the crowds gather, and he kind of pulls aside his closest followers for this incredible sermon, Matthew 5, 6, and 7, the Sermon on the Mount. And it's interesting because I always imagine if you're one of his close followers, and he pulls you aside like, great, we're special. We're going to find out what it means to be special in the kingdom of God, what it means to really get it, what it means to get ahead with the Lord. And Jesus begins with these beatitudes that none of us want any part of, but we can all resonate with, can't we? This list of those who are blessed by the Lord. Um, this laundry list of, again, things we would never wish upon ourselves, but can be comforted that the Lord sees us in the midst of it. And I would imagine that as he is laying out this list of those who are blessed by the Lord, um, they're wondering, okay, is that me? Am I in this or am I not? Um, in the Gospel of Luke, it gets a little more pointed. He gives these beatitudes, these blessings, and then he gives maledictions, curses. Blessed are you if this, cursed are you if this. Um, it's interesting, these blessings, this blessed are you. Um, he, he lists all these things that seem hard, that seem like suffering. That you would say, if that's happening to you, maybe God is not blessing you. And Jesus says, in fact, he is. Um, he, he's calling us uh, into a different way of life. He's calling us to share in the values of his a kingdom. And he is telling us that people who already are like this are in good shape. They should draw near with humility and worship the Lord who loves them and who sees them. Um, Jesus is saying that with this work, it, his, his kingdom is beginning to come. And so when Jesus comes, it's good news. And it's good news to those who are persecuted and grieving and mourning and poor and humble those who are left out and left aside uh, in kind of the way of the world. No, God is acting in and through Jesus to turn things right side up. And I would just say, if you're gathering on all saints and you see yourselves in these beatitudes, uh, know that the Lord sees you and he loves you in the midst of that. Um, and also I would say, as you think about the Sermon on the Mount as a whole, um, this is a great day to go, man, am I living out a life of discipleship Empowered by the Holy Spirit, following Jesus, where I start to see the fruit of this in my life. Because it's true that we are all called saints regardless of fruit, but the goal is not to be fruitless, is it? It's to grow into that uh, that we are in the Lord. Um, and so, by the way, if you look at these Beatitudes, um, we can't go through them individually, um, even with an extra hour. Um, but they seem to kind of group into to clusters of three. You can have this first section uh, that focuses on humility. Those who are poor in spirit, uh, those who mourn, those who are meek. Um, you have a whole cluster on those who are pursuing justice, those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, those who are merciful, those who are pure in heart. And then you have a whole section on those focused on peace. Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are you when you are persecuted. And in theory, then, not fighting back. Blessed are you and those insult you. It's all focused on humility. It's focused on justice. It's focused on peace. And by the way, today we have briefly paused. We've been in a series walking through the book of Daniel. And you guys have hung in there really well. We've got two more weeks coming up of that. Um, but we've been talking about flourishing in exile. What's it look like to flourish in the Lord? Um, and I would say that the Sermon on the Mount... And these shocking beatitudes are perfectly in line with what it means to flourish in exile, to pursue this kind of a kingdom-shaped life. Um, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, you guys know Dietrich Bonhoeffer? 
a German martyr. Um, here's what he said reflecting on the Sermon on the Mount. And I thought, man, you could almost say that this is a caption for Daniel and his friends in the book of Daniel as they're in exile. Here's what he writes. Um, this community of strangers possesses no inherent right of its own to protect its members in the world, nor do they claim such rights, for they are meek. They renounce every right of their own and live for the sake of Jesus. When reproached, they hold their peace. When treated with violence, they endure it patiently. When men drive them from their presence, they yield their ground. They will not go to law to defend their rights or make a scene when they suffer injustice nor do they insist on their legal rights. They are determined to leave their rights to God alone. They trust in him. And they show by every word and gesture, here's the thing, that they do not belong to this earth. You can only flourish in exile if you are not gripping tightly everything of this world. You can make that journey. All right. Um, we are, how, how are our egg timers doing? We're doing all right. All right. Um, Heart was doing good. I see it. I see it. Okay. Um, one more thing, and then we'll wrap up and move to our baptisms. Um, I was thinking about how do you tie in all these themes, all saints, the communion of the saints, baptism. Well, I think you go to Hebrews 12. Hebrews 12 has this fantastic image of the Christian life. It says, therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, the communion of the saints, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. This great race of faith with God's people cheering. And I thought, man, if you have ever been to a marathon or a half marathon, um, or if in years past you ever saw the half half, it's a picture of this. People all along the side cheering. And in the same way that Hebrew says the cloud of the communion of saints is cheering us in our walk with Christ, we're gonna bring these little ones and we're gonna invite them to start this race. And they're not gonna run fast. <laughs> they're not gonna run at all. We're, we're gonna actually rely on the Lord to help them as they take first steps and walk and eventually run and hopefully begin pursuing fully and maturely uh, the Lord Jesus. And so our role as the saints of God gathered is to cheer them on, to run with them, to be little water stops, say, hey, here, have some water. You're doing great, keep going. How do I do this? It's this way. We help point them along the way, um, and hopefully we are able to do that because we know how to run and are runners ourselves. We are running this race of faith fully focused on uh, the Lord Jesus, the one who makes us saints, who is our righteousness, who is our holiness, who is our perfection, such that we can gather and humbly say, Lord, thank you that you share your righteousness with me. Thank you, Lord, that um, in your death and resurrection, you brought salvation to me. And now let me fix my eyes on you as I run this race of faith. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Amen.